All right, guys, welcome to RC Mojo. Today we're going to build the Dynam Tiger Moth. Well, I say build, but for the most part, it's really just a quick assembly job. The plan is to try and get the fuselage built in my white box. I think there should be just enough space. Then go outside and install the wings and the rigging. OK, here's the instruction sheet. There's quite a bit of info here, but the only bit we're interested in is the build section. It's not the clearest set of instructions, but it should do as a guide. The first step is to attach the undercarriage. The small box has all the small parts in, like the undercarriage, the metal parts bags and the struts, which we'll need a couple of in just a minute. Right now, though, we need to empty the screws into some pots so we don't lose any of the bits. There's a couple of tubes of glue too, which is odd as I can't see any mention of glue in the instructions and I can't really see where it would be needed. In with the screws we have a small screwdriver and if you don't have any other tools it would probably do just fine. Right then, time to build. First I'm going to take off the cockpit hatch, we're going to be swinging the fuselage around a bit and we don't want to damage the windscreen. Flip the fuzz over and press the undercarriage in. Make sure the strut mounting tabs face forward. Work it in bit by bit until the middle bit of wire is flush with the bottom of the fuselage. There's no need to use any glue on this. In fact, as long as it's a good tight fit, no glue is better as it will allow just that little bit of movement on a rough landing. Next, we've got to fit the struts. We want two of the lighter yellow aluminium ones. There's two types. The ones with the sharp bend at one end are for the tail. We want the straighter ones. One end fits in the mounting tabs on the undercarriage, and the other lines up with a mount in the fuselage. Try each of the struts both ways round until you get one that's the closest fit. You may need to give them a slight tweak with some pliers. Just be very careful as the material is very brittle, too much bending and it will crack. The undercarriage end wants an M 2 by 8 screw to attach it, and even though there's no mention of it, it will also need a nut. When we've built the model, we're going to need to go around and pop some Loctite on them so they don't all fall out. It's best to do that after we're sure everything fits though. At the other end, we need a 25 by 6 mm self-tapper. None of these screws need to be done up tight, just enough that they're snug up to the struts. We want them to be able to move around a bit when landing. And it's the same assembly on both sides. There's a mod we'll probably need to do to the undercarriage to move it forward a little. Apparently, like a lot of more scale models, it tends to nose over on grass. We'll need to test that out first though, just to see how bad it really is. Next in the instructions, they want us to fit the bottom wing, but we can't do that yet. Next, the cabane struts and the interplanes, and we really can't do them yet either, which takes us up to the tail feathers. There's not much to it, the two bits just slot together and they seem to align quite nicely. I suppose you could use a little bit of glue here, but it's not really necessary, and if we don't glue it and we ever need to tweak anything, we can. The tail assembly neatly fits into the back of the fuselage. Again, you could glue it, but there's really not much point, it'll only add weight. To hold it all together, we need to use two 2.3 by 20 mm self-tappers. They go in through the bottom of the fuselage, where there's a plastic hard point, through that and tap into the plastic inserts in the fin. When both screws are in, the tail feels very solid. The tail wheel plate needs a couple of 2 by 8 mm self-tappers, which have some little plastic bits to thread into. Next, before we fit the tail plane struts, we need to fit the control horns. Although, thinking about it, it might have been easier to fit them before fitting the tail feathers to the fuzz. Oh well. There's some recesses moulded into the surfaces and some holes, making it all but impossible to put them in the wrong place. I only came up with one problem. None of the screws in the kit are long enough to pass through the horn and the back plate. Luckily, I just happen to have a bag of M2x20s that will do the job just fine. Two of the screws go through the hole in the horn, go through the surface, then screw into the back plate. The holes in the back plate are a little bit smaller, so the M2s can thread into them. This is another bit where a spot of glue might be useful to add some extra security. There's enough nuts in the kit, we can pop one on each of these screws too. If you add a little Loctite, they will be perfectly secure. The elevator horn is the same. The metal joiner for the elevator halves seems to be stuck on with hot glue, which is a little suspect. I've not seen it mentioned on the forums as a problem though, so it will probably be just fine. Clevis is next. 
The servos are pre-fitted, so all we need to do is make sure the arms are at 90 degrees to the body, which they are. Then we need to grab the push rod with some pliers and adjust the clevises so the push rod is just the right length. It's threaded so you can rotate it to adjust. We want the elevator to end up level with the tailplane. When it's just right, the clevis pin goes through the outer hole in the horn and gets clipped shut. The rudder is just the same, adjust the clevis, then clip it on in the outer hole. Tailplane struts now, and like the undercarriage ones, you might need to tweak the bends just a little bit. Be really gentle with them, because the metal is very brittle. All the mountings need 25 by 6 mm self-tappers. Fit the screws loosely, then tighten them up to take out the slack. There's really no need to do them up super tight. Same on the other side, having the struts really stiffens up the tail, not a hint of the usual foamy floppiness. Well, all that's left for the fuselage is to fit the prop, but I much prefer setting up the electronics without the prop, just in case something goes wrong and the motor spins up with me in the prop arc. The ready to fly version has the receiver fitted and wired up. This is the almost ready to fly, so we have to supply our own. I'm going to be using a AR610 to match up with my Spectrum DX8. A very nice, reliable combination. Inside the fuzz is a mass of wiring. Undo the cable tie and separate out the bits. We find a Y lead connecting the elevator and rudder servos, and we can remove that. If you are flying with a basic 4-channel radio, you would connect it up to the aileron servos. On the ESC lead is what I believe to be a signal booster. Whether it's actually needed is up for debate, but it shouldn't make anything worse, so we might as well keep it for now. We need to bind the receiver, so we'll connect up the rudder and elevator servos. We don't actually need the servos connected, but it makes it easier to see when the radio is correctly bound. We need the bind plug in the bind socket, and for power I'm using an old 4-cell receiver pack. You could connect up the ESC and use a flight pack instead. And there we go, DSMX 22 millisecond. Nice. The controls are backwards, but at least it's working. To mount the receiver, I'll be using some good old Velcro, but I can't do that now though, as the aileron leads are very short and I don't know where they're going to reach. So the radio will get mounted after the wing goes on. I always like to check everything on an ARTF, so we will be taking off the cowl so we can have a good look at the motor. It's held on with three small screws, with them removed it just slides away. It all feels nice and solid, looks like the aluminium mount is embedded in the foam so it's not going to be going anywhere. Nice. Next we have a minor issue. The ESC has a Deans connector, which is great, but all my batteries that will fit this model have XT60s, which obviously aren't going to fit. Luckily though, in my drawers I just happen to have a bag of XT60s. I won't bother showing how to solder an XT60, it's basically just a case of chopping off the Deans, stripping the insulation, adding the heat shrink, soldering the XT60s and shrinking the heat shrink over the terminals. Just be careful not to drop anything hot on the foam, because it really won't like it. OK, we can connect the ESC to the receiver and a battery and see what happens. Well, it beeps a lot, but that's about it. In the troubleshooting guide we have, after power on, motor does not work. Such and alert tone is omitted. Beep, beep, beep. Every beep has a time interval of about 0.25 seconds, which sounds exactly like what we've got. Looks like it means the throttle isn't going low enough to arm the ESC. This is actually a very common annoyance of most modern radios. Almost all ESCs work around it, so you'd never actually know. As you can see, the throttle on the top line goes from minus 100% to 100%, which sounds great. If you know the specs for the servos, that means the signal should be going from 1000 to 2000 microseconds, right? If we hook up our little servo tester, we can see with a stick at the bottom, the actual pulse width is 1096. With Spectrum, we can go into the servo travel setting and crank it up until we see the 1000 microsecond pulse width we need. We have the same issue at the top end, we're falling short by a similar amount. With the travel set to 124%, we now have the pulse width running at full spec, 1000 at the bottom and 2000 at the top. 
It's not just Spectrum that does this. Every computer radio I've used does something similar. Futaba, JR, they all do something pretty similar. Part of the problem is they use an arbitrary scale that doesn't actually relate to anything. The only exception I've come across is in the OpenTX firmware that allows you to use microseconds in the menus. Anyway, I could rant on about such things all day, but that's not going to get the Tiger Moth built. Okay, this time if we plug in the battery... It actually works. The ESC has a rather neat trick where it beeps a number of cells that it detects. So three beeps of 3S. So you know the cutoff voltage is correct and won't kill your pack. Nice. Okay, the cowl can go back on with its three self-tappers. Don't do them up tight. If you do, the plastic will crack around the holes. They just want to be set so the cowl doesn't flop around. Well, that's about all we can do inside, so we need to move into the garden. You'll have to excuse the inconsistent lighting. The clouds kept finding their way in front of the sun. First up, the Cobain struts get fitted to the fuzz with 25 by 8 mm self-tappers. They're quite tight to get in, so you have to be very careful doing them up. The other side is the same. If you want to be proper, you really want to leave them just a little bit loose and only nip them up once the top wing is fitted. Bottom wing now, and I ran into a little problem here. The instructions call for two 2.3 by 20 self-tappers and two 2.3 by 25s, and the 25s were missing. If you don't have stock of various fixings, you could be in a rather disappointing position. As I wasn't completely happy with the self-tapper wing fixings anyway, I tapped the mounts for M3 screws, countersunk the plates in the wing, and now I'm using long M3 nylon screws. They will be more than strong enough and more reliable if the wing needs to get refitted later. The wing itself just neatly slots into the fuzz and the four screws get tightened up. The fit and finish is excellent, everything lines up perfectly. Now the wing's in, we can see where the aileron leads come and where we can mount the receiver. As they're very short, it's going to have to be near where they emerge from the wing. I've made a little mounting plate from some scrap wood and velcro to go across the fuselage. I'm going to use Yoohoo Paw to stick it in as I know it will stick nicely to the foam. We're going to need some on the foam and some on the wood. Let it sit for 10 minutes. Carefully slide the plate in and press it down. It's going to stick almost immediately. The radio gets stuck down with the velcro, just leaving the long antenna. It wants to be mounted at 90 degrees to the short antenna, which is going fore and aft, so a good place for the long one is to make it vertical. A little bit of servo tape is going to do the job just nicely. Next we have the most time consuming bit of the entire build, the flying wires. Each of the mounting points in the fuselage and wings have a number, and each of the ends of the wires have a label with a matching number. The idea being you simply attach one to one, two to two, and so on. Sounds easy, but it's really easy to get into a tangle. The interplane struts need to be fitted to the lower wings. They fit to the outside of the mountings with the flying wires on the inside. They need M2 by 8 screws and nuts. Don't do any of the screws up tight yet, just do them up so they won't fall out. The top wing starts with being fitted to the cabane struts at the front. Since there's no flying wires attached to the front, you can go straight in with the screws and nuts to keep it all in place. The rest is just a case of linking up the flying wires with the correct mounting points and adding the last six screws to the struts. The problem comes when you get to the last two. There's enough tension in the wing that it's quite difficult to pull the eyelets over the screws and get the nuts on too. A second pair of hands to gently pull on the wing would make life a lot easier. Persevere though, as the wires really do stiffen up the entire structure, just like the full-size plane. With all the wires in place and all the screws nipped up, we can plug in the battery and test out the aileron. Well, they work, but the left aileron has quite the offset. What we really need to do is remove the servo arm and turn it one position. Unfortunately, because the servo is partially buried, we can't get to the screw, so we're going to have to use buckets of sub-trim to get it straight. Not ideal, but it will do. To make sure it's all in spec, we could always connect up the servo tester and check the pulse width. Well, nearly there now. We can fit the prop. The spinner back plate goes on first. It's got two little nubs that lock into holes in the aluminium boss. Quite neat and should mean it's never going to slip. Next is the prop. 
the washer and the nut. Make sure it's done up nice and tight. You will need to hold on to the back plate while tightening as the prop will just spin until there's a little bit of tension. The spinner just slots in at the front and is held on with a single M2 screw in the middle. Quite neat. It means there's nothing that's going to need careful alignment to get it all to fit. For testing it's always a good idea to have something heavy to make sure the model doesn't get away. On a model this size a house brick is plenty. We'll still need to hold the back down though as it will tend to try and pivot around the wheels. OK, battery in. ESC armed. Surface test. And that all looks good. Right then. Well, there's a bit of vibration. There seems to be plenty of pull there, even on a 3S pack. I'm sure with the recommended 4S it would be even better, but my well-trained eye says it's going to fly just fine on the 3. According to the general wisdom on the forums, for the best results it should be balanced just in front of the rear cabane mounts. This is a fair bit further back than what's in the manual, at 115 to 120 millimeters, but it just so happens with the 3S pack up front it balances just in front of the rear mounting. Possibly a little bit risky, but it should make for an entertaining first flight. And that, I'm afraid, will have to do for this week. I'll be adding some Loctite to all the metal-to-metal -metal screws and setting up the radio, dual rates and all that, before the next video. There's not much to do, just needs going over carefully before the first flight so we don't lose anything important. Thanks for watching, and as always, a like is always greatly appreciated. And don't forget, if you're not already, why not subscribe? It's free and you won't miss the next video. Bye guys.